welcome to Mondays at the Mound. My name is Sloan. I'm here with you guys again for Live at the Hive. Today we're going to be exploring one of our beehives here at Rock Eagle. So let's take a look. If you see our hive right here, the hive consists of multiple boxes. These boxes are called supers. Some of the boxes are really deep. Those are called deep supers. And then some of the other boxes are a little bit shallower. And those are what we call our honey supers. So the deep supers are for the queen to make new bees and all the baby bees. And then the other supers are to give them more space, but also hopefully room for them to make lots of delicious honey for us. You can see that there are bees going in and out of the hive to the entrance down here. So all of those bees flying in and out are forager bees and they're going out looking for flowers, pollen and nectar and they're bringing that back to the hive. Then at the top of the hive we've got our roof, we call it a telescoping roof. It's going to prevent water from entering the hive through rain so it's keeping the bees nice and dry. So I'm going to go ahead and pop up off the top. Now on the inside of the hive, we've got our inner cover. This is also helping to prevent moisture and rain from getting into the hive and also keeping out pets. Once I open the hive, here we can see all our bees. So I'm going to cover up half of the hive with this cloth because I want to keep the bees as calm as possible. Every time we open the hive, we're essentially disrupting their home. It would be like if someone came over, ripped off the roof of your house and started rearranging all of your furniture in your house while you were in it. So for the bees, we want, that's exactly what we need to do in order to check on them, see how the population is thriving, determine how much honey they have, how many babies they're producing. We want to know the health of the hive, so we have to disrupt them. We're just going to try and do that as minimally invasive as possible. In the hive, there are frames within this box, so I'm going to go ahead and take out one of these frames and I'm going to try and be as gentle as possible. I'm using this little tool here called a hive tool and it's just helping me pry the frames apart. So here is a frame. All of this yellow part right here, that's what we call foundation. That's giving the bees a blueprint to build their comb. Now bees don't need this foundation to build the comb. They instinctively know how to build that classic hexagonal shape, but humans like everything to be nice and neat and orderly. A natural beehive, there would be comb in every direction, hanging in different depths um, and in sheets of comb. But when we give them foundation and frames like this, that means that they're going to build their honey and their comb the way we want them to. So it just gives them a little roadblock, essentially. And this foundation has a little bit of wax on them to make them attracted to it, but they haven't started really building on this frame. There are a few bees you can see there checking it out, investigating it. That hexagonal shape is the strongest shape And it's also the most efficient sh shape. So not only is it strong and sturdy, but it's efficient for them to build. So I'm gonna explore the frames in this hive. So I wanna know if these bees are starting to build up here yet. The first step would be building out the wax and comb. And then they're going to start putting honey in here. Honey initially starts out as nectar, and that is what we have right here. 
So if you see on this frame, there you've got this beautiful white comb right here, and then this golden liquid in the comb, in the cells. All of that is nectar that will soon get essentially dehydrated and turned into that thick, delicious liquid that we call honey. So this honey or nectar is not ready for us to eat yet. The bees are starting on it. Now if you notice, over here you can actually see some honey oozing out. That wax that they've just now made is a beautiful white translucent color. It's fresh wax, it's new. Older wax may be very dark in color, almost black, and it changes color because bees, as they travel around and forage, and they may travel, one bee may travel to 10 or 50 flowers per flight. They're picking up little dirt and things like that on their feet. So when they come back into the hive and they go in the cells and deposit whatever they found, they're also wiping their dirty little feet in the cell. So older comb is much darker because it's dirty. It's not necessarily unhealthy for the bees, but it is something we can clear out because we want them to have nice, fresh, home. So this box, they're starting to build out those frames, adding wax and comb, and they're starting to put honey in those frames. We're going to take this box off and see what's down below in the next box here. I'm going to pry this box off using my hive tool and the reason I have to pry it off is because bees make their own glue. That glue is called propolis and they make it using the sap from trees and that glue is helpful for them because they can seal up all of the gaps that might be left from where we put boxes on, it'll help seal up any holes that naturally occur in their hive. So it is their glue that they can use to, to patch things up. And it is very strong, so I have to pry the box open. So here, you might notice that we have this grate on top of the hive. This is called a queen excluder. And that means that the queen cannot travel up through the hive into that top box. The reason we don't want the queen going up into that box is because we don't want her to lay eggs in that box. We want that box to be only filled with honey. The queen is the most important bee in the hive and her sole job is to lay eggs. She leaves the hive usually only one time when she goes out to mate, and she's going out to mate with male bees called drones. And then once she mates with several drones, she'll come back to the hive and she'll begin her duties laying eggs. And she can lay 2,000 eggs a day. So she can make 2,000 new bees in one day. And an egg, a bee egg, actually looks like a teeny tiny, almost microscopic piece of rice, a grain of rice. If we find any, they'll probably be too small for us to show you in the frame, but we can post a picture later and show you what a bee egg would look like. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use a little smoke for my smoker and this is just a cool smoke that I'm going to use and it just helps the bees move down into the frames of the hive so that I'm not in their way and they're not in my way as we try to work. Most of the bees that you see flying around 
are worker bees. So there are three types of bees in the hive. There is the queen, one queen. She's the largest bee in the hive. Then you may have a few drones. Those are males. They kind of look like bumblebees. They're also quite big, sort of stocky bees. And then the majority of the bees, all the bees that you see flying around, those are actually workers. And the workers are responsible for all of the work in the hive. So when workers first hatch and go through metamorphosis, they become nurse bees where they help take care of the other baby bees, the pupa. Then as they get older, they'll start building comb. And then the last stage of their life, when they're at their oldest, they will be foragers. So they're gonna go out to those flowers and pollinate the flowers and then bring back pollen and nectar for the hive. Now this is really exciting. This frame is full of honey. So if you notice on this frame, every cell on the frame is closed up. It looks kind of waxy, almost like it's been dusted in powdered sugar. This is what we call cat honey. And this is honey that we could eat. So if we had, if we got all of the bees off of this frame, we had a hot knife, we could melt the top layer of wax on this honey and then we would be able to scoop out or sling out all of the honey in the hive, in this frame, and eat it. And it would be delicious. If you have any questions while I'm searching through the hive, feel free to ask. Anna is filming again today, so she will let me know what your questions are. Well, Sloan, we don't have any questions from the audience right now, but we have a question for the audience. Salone, what was that trivia question that you were gonna challenge our audience to answer? Yes, thank you for bringing that up, Anna. So, we have a little trivia question for you guys. Um, if you get the answer correct, the first three people to get it correct will get a baseball cap from our canteen with a bee on a bee embroidered on the cap. So the question is, which state in the United States produces the most honey? Which state in the United States produces the most honey? And we'll make sure to check back on your answers and you'll be and check in with you um, once if you get the right answer so we can send out your caps later this week. Yeah, so leave those answers in the comments on this video. So we do have a question from the audience, Sloan. Um, do we get to eat the honey from these bees, like us here? Do we get to eat this honey? We sometimes do if we buy it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we sell it in our gift shop. Um, but we do get to eat the honey and we have harvested rock eagle honey. One of the things that we want to be careful of and be responsible beekeepers is that all of this honey is food for the bees. So when we extract the honey from the hive, we want to do it in a responsible way that we're not taking all of their food. So we want to make sure that our bees have built up enough honey stores so that when we take some of the honey away, they still have plenty of honey left, particularly enough honey to get through the winter time when there aren't any flowers blooming. So hopefully our bees will build up enough honey that we can take some of it off and then leave them plenty for the winter time. And these bees are doing an awesome job in this super, filling up all of that honey. Now one of these boxes once it's full of honey, it can end up weighing 50 to 75 pounds. Let's see what else we can find in the hive. In order for bees to make one pound of honey, 
the hive must travel travel to two million flowers and they also end up traveling 55,000 miles and that's essentially if the bees traveled two times around the earth so 55,000 miles and over two million flowers just to make one pound of honey and think about when you go to the store how many pounds of honey there are or when you go to a farmer's market how many pounds of honey are available to you to buy and purchase so it is very easy for us to eat and enjoy that honey but bees have put in a lot of work to make it and it's something we should be really thankful for so Sloan we have another question from our audience um it is have you ever been stung while taking care of the bees at Rock Eagle I have been stung there are things that we can do to make sure that we don't get stung, but it does happen. So one of the things that you guys might notice is that I'm wearing gloves. Bees will protect me from a bee sting. There's a bee trying to sting me right now through the glove, but she can't. I'm also wearing a veil. That's protecting my face from the bee stings. And then I'm wearing long pants, closed toed shoes, and a long sleeve shirt. So hopefully I'm fully protected and can't get stung, but it's always a possibility. It's something that we definitely wanna be careful of. Um, and it's something you can get used to, but you'd wanna be extra careful if you were potentially allergic. All right, so I think this super is full of honey. Let's try and go down one more and see if we can find some baby bees. So while Sloan is getting that other box off so we can look for some baby bees, we have here um, some specimens, if you will. In this little tiny box are a couple of bees. We actually ordered them. You can get bees in the mail. Um, we ordered them because one of our hives needed a new queen bee. Maybe the queen bee uh, flies away because there's not enough space. Maybe she dies for whatever reason. Um, and we are able to, luckily, we are able to provide our hives with new queens. So you can see a few bees in here and in this little container, the queen bee is the larger one and she has a red dot painted on her back. So that is how we can identify our queens. Oh, flipped over a little bit. Um, that's how we can identify our queens very easily by this color, this dot on their back. But also if you were to find a queen bee in the hive she is going to be much longer and bigger than the rest of the bees that you will find in there so we have a few more audience questions okay. krista martin hey krista we miss you is asking how long have the bees been at rock eagle that's a good question and we have had bees for many many years at rock eagle the bees that you are seeing flying around today are not necessarily the bees that were here even five years ago. So another question is how long did you study honeybees in order to do this work? So you don't have to have a degree in honeybees or entomology. Um, I did attend what we call bee school which is put on through the Young Harris College and through the University of Georgia. And it's a big conference held every May in Hiawassee, except for unfortunately this May. And that is where beekeepers from all around the world will come, socialize, learn from each other. There are talks that you can, that you can attend. And then if you're a beginner beekeeper, you can become a certified beekeeper by taking a test. I'm a certified beekeeper and then you can work towards higher levels of beekeeping depending on um, how many years and your experience level. So there are lots of things that you can do with bees. 
but you can have bees in your backyard. People even keep bees in the city. So as long as there are flowers within a mile of you and your city ordinances allow for hives, there are beehives even in the middle of downtown Atlanta. A, bees will travel about a mile away to look for flowers. So you don't have to have flowers directly in your yard for them to forage on. But if you do, that is fantastic because you're not only helping bees, you're helping other pollinators. And when we say pollinators, we're talking about insects that as they travel to flowers, they're picking up some of that yellow dust on their feet or on their body. And when they travel to another flower, it will leave some of that pollen behind and help grow fruit from those flowers. So Anna, this is a really cool frame. On the corners, you can see some capped honey. And then if Anna gets really close, the glossy cells, that's nectar, which will turn into honey. But there are some cells that look orange or kind of a grayish yellow. That is all pollen. So bees collect pollen and nectar. The honey, what the nectar becomes, is their sugar source. The pollen is their protein source, and they need to collect pollen for the baby bees. Sloan, we have another question. How often do you have to check the hives here? That depends. During the winter time, we really don't check them at all because we don't want to expose them to the cold temperatures. But during the spring and summer, we might check them once a week or every two weeks or so, um, depending on our goals and what we're looking for. If we think that they're going to be full of honey, then we might check them more often. If we think that their numbers are building up too much and we might want to do some management to keep them from swarming or leaving their home because it's too small, we'll do more management. But they're one of the easier animals to keep because they don't need food every day. They don't, they make their own food. So we can check them once a week to once a month sometimes. So here is what I've been looking for. If you look on this frame, you've got some cat honey up in the corner. We've seen that now, but then you've got all of these brown capped cells. Those are what we call capped brood. And those are brood baby bees that are gonna be going through metamorphosis and they'll chew their way out. You might've been able to see some white larva in those cells as well. Those are baby bees waiting for the nurse bees to come and cap them so they can go through metamorphosis. Here's more capped brood over here, which is awesome to see because we want to make sure that our queen is laying enough eggs because these bees right now during the spring and summertime, they are working really hard to produce lots of honey. And that can also mean that their lifespans are really short. So during the summertime, bees usually only live for a couple of weeks. During the winter time, they may live a couple months and that's because they're not working as hard, their metabolism isn't as high, and they need to make it through the winter time so that they can go out and forage, hopefully when it gets again. All right, and I'll see. So I have in my hand a drone, if you wanna come I think he flew away. He flew away. That's okay. Drones don't do any work in the hive. So if we lose a drone, he flew away, that is okay. His goal is to mate with queens from other hives. I was going to see if we can find a drone. Here we go. And bees on the same frame so you guys could see a size comparison. Of could course, you point them out to us? Yes. Let's see. They move around quite quickly. <laughs> My 
I have to pull out another frame. It is, oh, here we go, Anna. It is highly unlikely that we'll see the queen. Where is he? Can you point him out? Let's see. I think they're flying off. They're flying off. I think we've right. made them a little agitated. We will send a picture. Oh, of course there's one. But we have we'll pictures. We'll send a picture showing the different size comparisons of what the bees look like compared to each other. Like I said, it's unlikely that we'll see the queen today because she's gonna go try and hide in a dark place. So usually once I lift the covers off, she'll dive deeper into the hive so that she stays protected. Occasionally we see her, but seeing all those baby bees, we know that she's in the hive. So that's a good way for us to tell that she's in there, even if we don't see Right. I'm gonna close this up. If you guys have any more questions, feel free to leave them in our comments and we'll make sure to answer them in just a little bit. We also posted an awesome activity previously to our Facebook page. One of our seasonal educators, Sarah Leonard, developed a activity where you can actually build your own pollinator house. A pollinator house is an easy way to attract pollinators such as bees to your yard and that way you're providing them with a home so that they can go out and pollinate lots of flowers and that will hopefully make some of the foods that we eat. Bees and other pollinators, their activity um, and the services that they provide by pollinating crops are worth about $40 billion a year. So the bees that we have, the other, the butterflies and the other pollinators are worth $40 billion. So if you like to drink your coffee in the morning, if you love to eat strawberries right now, this time of year, if you love to eat watermelon coming up in the summertime, you love cashews, cherries, almonds, and almond milk, all of those foods are capable and, and things that we can eat because we have bees. They are pollinated by bees. So without bees, we wouldn't have any of those foods. So it's just another reason to appreciate these tiny insects. They do sting, but most of the time when we see them out, they're just gonna check us out. And as long as we don't disturb them, we don't get close to their hives and their homes, they're gonna leave us alone because we're not a flower. So they're gonna check us out and then leave. I hope that you guys enjoyed today's Monday at the Mound and tune in tomorrow for Tuesdays on Tybee at three o'clock. Have a good afternoon, everyone.